Microtransactions are referred to by some gamers as the worst thing to ever happen in gaming history. As developers no longer focus on creating single player experiences for the player and are now focused on creating content that they can monetize very heavily. And in this video, we are going to be taking a look at the horrible history of microtransactions. Now, originally, I was going to write a script for this video, but I needed to, to do research for this video, and I came across a, well, article that pretty much said what I wanted to say. And this article is titled, The Harsh History of Gaming Microtransactions from Horse Armor to Loot Boxes. And it is by Mike Williams, Reviews Editor, and it was published on 11th October 2017. So we are going to kind of see some of the stuff that he said in this article uh, that kind of came true, which is really crazy. Uh, if you want a link to this article, a link will be down in the description below for everybody. But like I said, the article is titled The Harsh History of Gaming Microtransactions from Horse Armor to Loot Boxes. Loot boxes are currently the most debated topic in gaming, but we've had over a decade of in-game money grabbing. Featured by Mike Williams, Reviews Editor, 11th October 2017. Sorry to repeat myself. Loot boxes are a trend that the game industry has heartily bought into in 2017. They've been around for almost a decade in the massively multiplayer online space. But since the release and success of Overwatch in 2016, the business model has had more visibility. Major developers and publishers have adopted the model before and since. What thrust the mechanic into the spotlight was a trio of major releases, Forza Motorsport 7, Middle Earth Shadows of War, and Star Wars Battlefront 2. And if you were playing games around that time, you kind of know what a big deal the loot boxes in Star Wars Battlefront 2 kind of were. Everybody was kind of talking about it, and they talked about how it would lead well down a slippery slope, which is kind of what we're going to read in the next paragraph. And it says, Together, the three have fueled a backlash against loot boxes. Some have sworn never to buy a game with the business model attached. A number of players fear the slippery slope. If you ignore loot boxes now, then publishers and developers will double down on the form. And that's a fear you can understand. If you take a look back at business practices in the industry. So let's wander back through the history of all the ways that publishers have aimed to drain your wallet. And this is kind of true. If we look at a lot of recent games, a lot of them are heavily monetized by essentially companies that make games. They have moved away from focusing on single player games to focusing on content that they can monetize heavily, which is very unfortunate. And even though they don't sell a lot of those games, the player base that plays those games kind of initially, if you will, that small player base that is still playing, even though the average gamer isn't, that small player base is still essentially buying microtransactions and they're kind of fueling, uh, I guess you could say, uh, that company, if you will. And sorry, I, I, I know that's a terrible way of explaining it, but let's just continue with the article. You knew it was coming. And it has this picture here of a horse uh, from Oblivion. It says, microtransactions first gain large scale visibility way back in 2006. Bethesda Softworks had just released the Elder Scrolls uh, for Oblivion for PC and Xbox 360 in March of that year. It was still early in the Xbox 360's lifespan and Oblivion stood as a critically acclaimed and fan favorite RPG exclusive for console. Microsoft had previously offered up the idea of microtransactions in early 2005 as a feature of the new Xbox Live mar Marketplace prior to the launch of the Xbox 360. The platform holder uh, played microtransactions up as a new revenue stream for publishers and developers at the same time. Microsoft called it a boon for players who didn't have to spend five, 10 or $20 for bundles of content they didn't want. Instead, they could directly buy what they wanted for one to $5. And you see this kind of with a lot of these games that are heavily monetized where a developer will tell you, oh, this is why we're doing it. Uh, X, you know, A, B and C, it's a better deal for you. And it really helps us. Is that true in some ways? Probably, but we all know why these developers are focusing on, you know, kind of uh, games that they can heavily monetize. It's because they can make a lot of money. And even if the average gamer's not happy with it, 
the people who do play those games, like I said earlier, are going to essentially buy a bunch of microtransactions and kind of make up for that lost player base of the average player. Essentially, they have a dedicated fan base who's willing to kind of, I guess you could say, pay for stuff that they're creating, uh, and uh, that fan base kind of fuels them, if you will. Generally, if you do anything less than $5, you end up eating up the bulk of that $5 in transactions fees, said Xbox Live General Manager Cami uh, Ferrari, I hope I said that right, I apologize if I didn't, told uh, reorders at the time. At the heart of it, it'll be a points-like system where you buy points and then use those points to make purchases, which is kind of what we see with Call of Duty points. Not only do you have to sweep away the distinction between virtual and real, you have to stop looking at video games as a toy and start looking at them as an entertainment service. Synthetic Worlds author and Indiana University professor Edward Castronova said in the article, this is one of the earlier uh, mentions of a concept of games as a service. And we all know a lot of developers are kind of moving to games as a service type systems. EA has been doing it. Bethesda did it recently with Fallout 76. Um, you know, uh, basically, you know, Call of Duty's kind of moved into having a bunch of uh, microtransactions in it. Uh, basically, you know, uh, any real like kind of major game that's not strictly single player has a bunch of microtransactions in it. And like I said, developers have moved away from single player content to focusing on content that they can monetize heavily. And I'm sorry to repeat myself again and, and I'll stop, but you guys kind of get the point. Microsoft itself offered a winter themed outfit for Cameo elements of power for 250 alongside new maps for Perfect Dark Zero and new cars for Project Gotham Racing 3. None of these early microtransactions took off in a major way, but it was all about Microsoft showing a proof of concept to their publishers. And I remember being a kid and kind of really wanting those things, and I would buy those things even if I wasn't supposed to, and I'd get in trouble for it. Uh, like, big trouble. So, uh, yeah, those kind of predatory practices put a lot of people off from video games with microtransactions because a lot of these games that have microtransactions you know their player base is well kids children and children you know really want the new thing the new fortnite skins the new apex skins and you know the new whatever skins uh bethesda was the first third-party publisher to jump in on microsoft's idea in April 2006, it released the first of its planned expansion content for Oblivion. The release was the infamous Horse Armor Pack for 200 Microsoft points, $2.50 on Xbox 360 or $1.99 on PC. Players could purchase alternate armor sets for their in-game steed. Fans were previously fine with the idea of microtransactions, but were absolutely shocked by the pricing of the horse armor. In response, Bethesda simply moved forward with its plans, releasing new themed homes and new dungeons and new spells. That's kind of crazy that they put that kind of stuff behind a paywall, but it's what a lot of developers do nowadays. And although it's not game breaking, it would be nice to have those things uh, you know, for free, but the developer makes you pay for them, which is unfortunate. Uh, I understand that the developer has to make money, they have employees to pay and stuff like that, but sometimes, you know, shady business practice is, well, shady business practice. We're not going to make any knee-jerk decisions based on it. The armor being available for five hours. We'll see what folks think and put out a few others we have planned and figure out where to go from there, said Bethesda VP of PR Marketing Pete Hines at the time. He is still the uh, PR marketing, I believe, for Bethesda. Some folks seem excited and are already using it. Others don't want it. Maybe those uh, will really want the Ori of the Wizard's Tower. We'll see when they come out and use that info to determine what we put out, how much, etc. It was hearsay in the gaming community. Fans rallied and raged at Bethesda. Since then, horse armor has been held up as an early infamous example of downloadable content and microtransactions gone wrong, but the actual material uh, hit to Bethesda was almost nil. 
fans bought the horse armor, making it one of the top 10 purchase downloads for the game on Xbox Live. Fans purchased the Wizard's Tower and Thieves Den, which were just different homes for players. Bethesda made a heap of money on top of the 60 fans paid for the Xbox 360 version of Oblivion, which is kind of crazy. That kind of content should have come for free or it should have come in, you know, DLC type packs. I have no problem with DLC packs if they add tons of content. Um, I have a problem when they add like one thing and it's 10 bucks. When it's like, oh, here's a potion, it's $5, or here's horse armor, it's four bucks. That kind of stuff kind of gets me upset. When it's original content made from scrap that the developing team has to put together and it's really good and it has like a lot of original ideas, like for example, the DLCs for Skyrim, you know, Dawn Guard, um, forgetting the other one's names, I'm blanking, but those DLCs were original, they were fun, I'm willing to pay for that kind of stuff. But what sucks is that video game developers will try to monetize everything. One weapon skin, you know, and it'll be like 10 bucks or whatever have you. And it's kind of wild to see. And it's kind of wild to see this article written saying that, hey, it's going to be a slippery slope. And well, it turned out it was a very slippery slope. In response to loot boxes these days, people are actually starting a preference for direct microtransactions like the horse armor. Instead of getting a blind box of random content, people would rather have the ability to directly purchase what they want in game. Some games like Dead or Alive 5 last round subsist on an endless stream of new customers and characters that players can purchase directly. Nintendo has made it an art form with Amiibo. A line of $13 figures with near uh, field communication NFC chips, allowing them to unlock additional content within a wide variety of games, which is kind of wild. None, no one even blinks at the addition of direct microtransactions anymore. People will happily pay $4.99 for a character, $2.99 for a character costume, or $1.99 for a series of emotes, given that horse armor seems rather normal and inexpensive in comparison. And keep in mind, there's some games I do like to support, some free-to-play games where the developer makes no money from your initial purchase. But if the developer is making like $60 from your initial purchase, there's no reason that they should be charging you for like skins and stuff like that. Uh, unless it's like something that, you know, like unless it's like a whole entire DLC that, you know, a bunch of work went into original concepts and stuff like that. Online passes, playing the gatekeeper. The gaming industry has always had a problem with the secondhand market. Stores like GameStop, pawn shops, and services like eBay allow customers to sell their used games for money. In the minds of publishers, the problem is that the revenue from those sales don't benefit them. They see every subsequent used sell as a missed opportunity for the sale of a new copy. And I, I believe there was some talk like a long time back where uh, you know, publishers weren't going to allow people to do that anymore. That once you put the disc in your uh, system, that it would kind of be locked to your system and you can like give your friend the game. Or I could have sworn I heard something like that. Maybe I'm remembering wrong. Maybe it's something else. But yeah, it's kind of crazy. I mean, but it is missed opportunity for them. But what did they do about it? In 2010, Electronics Arts had an idea about how to fix the problem or at least lessen the perceived blow. A year prior, the company had been offering bonus content for titles like Mass Effect 2, Dragon Age Origins, and Battlefield Bad Company 2 under the Project $10 initiative. Buy a game new and you'd get a code that would unlock new outfits, characters, or items. Buy a game used and there'd be no code. But EA wanted to go a step further. The expansion of Project $10 became the online pass. New games would come with a single use code inside the package, just like Project $10. The difference was inputting the code wouldn't unlock extra content, it would unlock previously standard features. Tiger Woods PGA Tour 11 was the first game with the system requiring the online passcode to unlock online team play and other online models. The pass was offered that year for NCAA Football 11, NHL 11, Madden NFL 11, NBA 11, FIFA 11, and EA Sports MMA. Buying any of those games secondhand meant having to pay $10 for a new pass to unlock the online play. Oh my god, that is fucking scummy.
We've made a significant investment to offer the most immersive online experience available. We want to reserve EA Sports Online services for people who pay EA to access them. What said current EA CEO Andrew Wilson, who was EA Sports Senior Vice President at the time, in order to continue to enhance the online experiences that are attracting nearly 5 million connected game sessions a day, Again, we think it's fair to get paid for the services we provide and to reserve those online services for people who pay EA to access them. The online pass built upon an idea Sony Computer Entertainment had uh, earlier tried SOCOM US Navy SEALs uh, Fireteam Bravo 3. Sorry for stumbling. For PlayStation Portable came with an unlock code for online multiplayer. It was there to protect against piracy which was a major problem for the PSP. Once EA launched games uh, with online passes, Ubisoft followed suit a year later by opening up the Uplay Passport system. Games like Driver San Francisco worked like EA's titles, locking players out of online play if they lacked the single-use code packed in the new releases. Activision, Warner Brothers, THQ, and more followed EA and Ubisoft down the path of online passes. Wow, that's crazy. There was heavy criticism from players over online passes. Some wanted to be able to freely sell and repurchase games in the secondhand market, which you should be able to do. Players who generally rented games were completely out of luck with the new business model. Some players warned uh, that content that was normally in game would be locked behind a code in the feature. After three years of using the system, Electronic Arts was also the first to step up and kill it, reportedly in response to planned DRM measures in the upcoming Xbox One and PlayStation 4. EA canceled the online pass program in May 2013. Publicly, EA said it was just listening to feedback. Oh, no, they weren't. They were about to get got. Initially launched as an effort to package a full menu of online content and services as many players didn't respond to the format We've listened to the feedback and decided to do away with uh, it moving forward EA senior director of corporate communication Johns Rosenberg told game beats in 2013 Online passes ended up as one of the few times that the industry completely backed away from a business model with additional transactions I'd say that's probably a victory, question mark. But they kind of uh, make it up, make up for it in other areas, you know, w when they're trying to essentially monetize the hell out of content now. Now you get kind of bare bones with your game, you know, and they're like, hey, now you got to buy the season pass or you have to buy a bunch of skins or you have to, you essentially get no content besides what came with the game. And if you want anything else, if you want anything cool like your friends have, you got to pay for it which kind of sucks. Season passes, publishers are doing you a favor, right? A year after Electronic Arts launched the online pass, Rockstar Games offered their own pass. The Rockstar Pass for LA Noir gave players access to all the planned downloadable content, two additional cases, new outfits, new weapons, and an item collection challenge. At a solid discount while buying all of that, DLC would cost players $20 individually. The Rockstar Pass was only $12 on PlayStation 3 or 960 Microsoft points on the Xbox 360. If you were planning to buy all the content, you saved 8 bucks. This trick is most players weren't likely to buy all the DLC. By bundling up everything and offering a discount, Rockstar Games was able to entice players to buy content they normally wouldn't. Wow, that's interesting. The 2011 reboot of Mortal Kombat, which actually launched a month before L.A. Noir, offered its season pass in June of that year. That season pass would establish the fighting game uh, standard, giving players access to all additional character releases. Activision's Call of Duty franchise launched uh, the game Call of Duty Elite membership for Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 in September 2011, acting somewhat like a season pass. Elite was a $50 a year subscription fee that unlocked access to all COD map packs for that year, in addition to streaming content. A special site and more, the season pass practice eventually moved to most major titles in 2011 and beyond, including Borderlands 2, Destiny, Evolve, Gears of War 3, 
Forza Motorsports 4 and Battlefield 3, and the season pass is still a thing with today's games. Those who take issue with the system point out that the publishers are essentially getting players to pre-order additional content. You put down $60 for a game and at the same time $20 to $30 for downloadable content. Many times players have no clue what they're paying for. Characters are hidden, feature expansions aren't detailed, you're pre-purchasing in hopes that the publisher or developer will deliver on some uh, nebulous, uh, nebulous promise. This also led to the rise of deluxe editions, which are generally just the base game with the season pass already included, which is which is true. This is something that happens with developers. Well, they'll kind of like, you know, say, hey, look, this is the cool DLC content. This is our game. You know, if you buy our game and then you have to buy 20 to 30 dollars worth of additional content like this says. And they still do that to this day, which which is insane to me, which is why I really like uh, things like Xbox Game Pass. And I'm not sponsored by them or anything, but Microsoft, if you want to sponsor your boy, I take it in a heartbeat because, you know, look at the Microsoft Game Pass, right? You essentially pay nine bucks a month and I get every single game on there. For me, it's worth it since, you know, I, I stream video games on Twitch. You can find me down in the description below. Uh, you know, I stream video games on Twitch, so it's worth it for me. For some people, it might not be worth it, but nine dollars a month, a hundred and what twenty dollars a year, basically, for you know, every single game, every single Xbox exclusive, you know, that's gonna be released. You know, every single game that's gonna be released on Game Pass, that's that's totally worth it. And it's my, and that's why, in my opinion, I think Microsoft is probably gonna win the console wars. But that's for another video. Okay, so here we go. Let's, let's continue to read. Season passes are still going strong to this day. They are, even in 2022. Some of the loot boxes mentioned at the beginning of this article also have season passes. Forza Motorsport 7 has the car pass, giving you access to six monthly car releases, 42 cars in total for 30 bucks. Middle Earth Shadows of War has an expansion pass, offering access to four expansions for $40. What the fuck? The upcoming Assassin's Creed Origin has a season pass with more story content and two outfit packs. What? And, and it's not even that much content when you when you get these things. Like the content that you're pre-ordering is like 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 10 like 30 minutes more of stuff and that's it. On the side of consumers, there's no real visibility as to whether the prices originally set for DLC have any meaning. There's value added to digital content. Some of that is related to the production of said content. The players never know how much. If the cost of, to produce a DLC pack is $2 per customer, it's suggested store price is $6. And the season pass brings that down to four. But the publisher has still made a hearty profit. And it's got a little picture of the Nintendo DLC pack here. Season passes don't surprise players anymore. No, they do not. Hell, even The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild offers a season pass this year to very little in the way of commendation for a publisher that previously avoided such measures. The perception is simply that the discounts are worthwhile, especially for the avid and favorite fans of a game. Which is true. Like I said, their fans are kind of what makes them. If you're a diehard fan of something, you're probably going to play that game and you're most likely going to buy that DLC content. And that's what game publishers are realizing. So they're no longer making the game for the average player. And I know I'm repeating myself. I know I've said this like eight times. They're no longer making the game for the average player. They're making it for the wells, essentially. The people who are going to buy their game and support it through microtransactions. Loot boxes step up and try your luck. All of this brings us to loot boxes. Loot boxes are the current zygast. Zygast? I hope that's how you say it. For our industry the idea is either through progression in game currency or real money the player is gifted a mystery box inside of the box can be costumes skills gear other random items specific to the game the player wants the unlockable item and these blind boxes are the only way to get them in some cases there are alternate methods of purchase available 
but the random luck of loot boxes is designed to be the easiest way. And the thing about loot boxes is that it's effectively gambling. In fact, I believe your odds of getting something really good out of a loot box are worse than if you actually went to Vegas and gambled. So I, loot boxes are very shitty in that way. They've been used in digital collectible card games uh, for some time now as a digital form of trading card booster packs. Much like players of Magic the Gathering, buy build booster packs to get the cards they want. Titles like Hearthstone and Gwent have players tearing open digital packs. In many cases, these digital booster packs are the only way to get the cards, making them the only real method of progression in CCGs. Even Magic has gotten in on the action with Wizards of the Coast offering a web-based and PC client of the card game. Despite this, the genesis of uh, loot boxes stretches farther back. Publishers and developers sometimes entice players by making more expensive versions of loot boxes, which have a better chance to drop better stuff. Rarity and one of the common ways companies get players to pick up further loot boxes open more boxes get a chance at a better more rare item some games like overwatch offer seasonal limited time events encouraging players to buy more loot boxes to get the seasonal skins they want new item acquired you found and here's a little crate i don't know what game this is from the loot box model started in chinese and korean massive multiplayer and free-to-play games but the first shot at them on the western side of things was Valve's, two, Valve's Team Fortress 2. In 2011, June 2011, Valve transitioned the game to free-to-play business model after the launch of the Man Company update in 2010, which introduced crates and item trading. MMOs that fell on hard times like Star Trek Online and Lord of the Rings Online switched to model when switched to the model when they went free to play as well. And it's, this happens with a lot of games. A lot of games that don't do well as you know online services will go free to play and then they'll kind of load up on the loot boxes. And it's still something companies do to this day when their online game doesn't work well or when their online game starts dying. There were paid games that offered loot boxes at the same time, though usually they left the mechanic for online multiplayer modes. Mass Effect 3's Galaxy at War multiplayer launched with purchasable equipment packs, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, and weapon cases in 2013, requiring an additional key to unlock. Players on Battleground toyed with a very similar idea. Battlefield 4 launched with battle packs, adding real money purchases in 2014. Releases from 2016 were riddled with loot boxes. Call of Duty Infinite Warfare has supply drops and zombie crates. Halo 5 Guardian has rec packs, Battlefield 1 has battle packs, and Gears of War 4 has gear packs. Loot boxes began with countries like China and Korea, and those countries have since cracked down on the business model as a form of unregulated gambling. China's Ministry of Culture laid down laws in 2016 that forced all companies to disclose the odds of specific items dropping from loot boxes in their games. This disclosure included information like escalating odds, meaning opening more boxes at the same time increased the chance of getting rarer items and the true drop rate of some items, falling as low as 0.1% in some cases. South Korea has tried to draft similar legislation. And uh, that's that's crazy. I, be I, I believe that uh, China no longer allows uh, loot boxes at this current moment in time. I could be wrong. But I remember seeing a video back in like 20, I don't know, I don't know when it was. It, it was recent. I don't know why I'm saying 20 something. But the video took place like in like early 2000s. And essentially like it was this kid and his parents were just like beating the crap out of him in this uh, kind of a, you know, PC center where, you know, you go, you play a PC game, like a PC, a PC lounge, whatever you want to call it you know, uh, where all the computers are set up and everybody goes in there and they get to use a computer and rent it for a couple of minutes, play the game and go home. I, they, they, his parents went in there and started beating him. And supposedly he had taken his parents like debit card and wasted their entire life savings, their entire life savings on in-game content. So that is, that is wild. And 
it really sucks because there's kids that take their parents credit card like i did when i was a kid and bought stuff i wasn't supposed to do i only bought one thing but you know still i was buying stuff i wasn't supposed to and i got in big trouble for it and thank god i wasn't like completely stupid and you know bought everything that i seen but there are some people who can't control themselves who you know love video games and they want to have all the new items and they'll go and they'll like spend their entire life savings on a game and the gaming companies are like well sorry man uh no refunds you know what i mean if, if a situation like that happens so it really really sucks um and and those are the kind of people that their companies are looking for that they want to play their game are the people who are going to pay lots of money to get those in-game items to buy their season passes to buy their you know special edition stuff those are the kind of people that companies are going for nowadays rather than focusing on single player content they're focusing on this monetized type content as part of gambling conversation folks and organizations have begun to understand that since real money can enter the picture these virtual items carry real value Valve is under several lawsuits, including underage and illegal online gambling related to Counter-Strike global offenses. Apparently, this is a long-standing problem of using rare CSGO skins to bet on professional matches, which makes sense given that some knives are worth hundreds of dollars. And there are some, you know, YouTubers who have gotten trouble for owning gambling sites and not telling people that they own these gambling sites. And they essentially take, they're essentially, you know, they're essentially ripping you off. You know, you put a $300 knife skin in and, you know, your chance of winning, you know, whatever is like 10%, 50%, 60%, but then you lose that. And now that person is making a bunch of money and you really never had a chance of winning in the first place. You know, a lot of those sites are kind of scammer ish, if you will. Unfortunately, um, it's a gray area at the moment, especially in the United States. Even among gaming communities, people have various tolerances for business models. Fans of Overwatch are generally fine with loot box because they feel that only cosmetic items like skins, emotes, and sprays come from them. Uh, in contrast, Shadow of War is getting pushback because the orcs you gain from War Chest impart direct gameplay benefits. And this is what I've said in the past. If it's cosmetic, it's fine in my opinion. Obviously, there's predatory business practices or whatever, but it's fine in my opinion if it's only cosmetics. Where it becomes a problem is when it becomes a pay-to-win situation, where it, where it starts directly impacting the gameplay benefits, like the article says. How far will consumers let it go? Even without the gambling conversation regarding loot boxes, there are still wells and even casual players keep buying into additional game content overwatch costs 40 dollars for the standard edition but i've probably put 10 dollars into the game during each seasonal event to get some of the special skins given that there have been eight such events since launch that's around 80 dollars for the game meaning it'd be 120 if i purchased it at launch with another blizzard title title world of warcraft i purchased the base game for 60 and every expansion up until warlords draenor uh when i began reviewing the series professionally four times 50 add in the monthly fee that i that i'm mostly paid since uh launch in 2004 154 times 15 and the various pets and mounts i've purchased on the blizzard shop 40 dollars in total and it begins to add up uh, as a very profitable game for Blizzard. $2,601 from me alone. And keep in mind, there's some people who are addicted who will spend 10 times that. I've know people who play GTA 5 who've spent thousands of dollars on, on GTA 5. And I've know people who play GTA RP who have spent thousands of dollars in GTA 5 RP. Just not even actual Grand Theft Auto, but like an RP server. It's easy to see why companies want to move in this direction, and I can't say I'd do anything different. As WoW has provided me with hours upon hours of entertainment, players balk at prices for additional game content, unless it's their favorite platform holder, publisher, developers, or game series, then it's okay. It's true, you know, it's uh, hard to tell when your own breath smells like shit, essentially. You know, I could sit here and criticize microtransactions on game A all day, but my ass is over there playing game B all day, buying all their shit. 
and it's wild because if you really love the series like i said you're gonna support it you're gonna pay for it but you kind of just don't notice these you know practices that they're putting in because you know you don't notice it because it's something that you're enjoying and it's kind of wild you know but if you really took an objective look at games you know uh you kind of understand what these companies were doing and this article it, it's gonna make me when i play a game think about hey why the fuck am i gonna purchase this content why am i gonna purchase these skins i'm gonna probably not even be playing the game in two weeks i'm probably gonna play it really heavily for the next you know oh week and a half and then by you know next week sometime i'm not never gonna play it again so it's you know it's 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 like that the backlash against loot boxes is rising in 2017 but business models and others like it have been around for some time in the industry's biggest games what's changed is this uh in this case is shadows of war bringing the loot boxes into the single player side of the equation while most games have kept the business model purely on the multiple multiplayer side of things likewise having three major titles with loot boxes occupying public uh, conscious at the same has heightened the growing trend it's not new just salient i don't know what that word is and you're writing articles for gamers you can't be using big words like that and if this look back at history is an indication being afraid of the slippery slope isn't all that shocking so what is the gaming community going to do about it? And what does the gaming community do about it? Right here. Players balk at prices for additional game content unless it's their favorite platform holder, publisher, developer, or game series. Then it's A-OK. -okay. And to be honest, I really don't see any way out of the slippery slope. I think it's the only way games can be made nowadays. I don't think a developer in their right mind would be like, oh yeah, let's produce a classic, uh, you know, video game that's focused directly on, you know, the single player experience. And we include all the DLC content with our, you know, uh, with our initial purchase. And then when we release the game, you know, we work really hard on more content and we let them pay for that. No developer is going to do that anymore. It's going to be, hey, pay for this content we already made and pay for the game, you know, that you're about to buy as well. So it's, it's wild. It's wild. A horrible history. A fucking horrible history. A slippery slope that you fucking, we all slid down and we're all going down. You know, we might point fingers at each other and say, hey, your game sucks, your game sucks, your game sucks, your game sucks. Your game sucks. But we're all fucking uh, headed on that, uh, you know, slide down. You know, the slide at the fair with all the fucking, you know, like the all the different colors and the fucking, you know, slopes and shit. We're all headed down that same slide and we're all making fun of each other. Your game sucks. Your game sucks, bitch. Your game sucks, bitch. But we're all in our own game, you know, doing the same shit that we're criticizing other people for. It's wild. Uh, but yeah, sorry for the long video, but it's fucking long ass history. Anyways, guys, love you. Hope you did enjoy it. If you did, please be sure to drop a like, comment, and subscribe as it really does help the channel grow. Like I said, link's going to be down in the description below for this. Uh, if you want to watch me live on Twitch, down in the description below. Love you. Peace out. Have a good one. And good night.